Beloved guest on this show passed away a couple of months ago. The world knew Telly Savalas as the tough, lollipop-chewing detective, Kojak. His friends and family knew him as a magical man of boundless charm and generosity. We got the chance to see that side. When I say, look, I'm sweet, I'm soft, I'm warm, I'm affectionate. I'm all these dear things that belong in the bedroom. Don't put me on the street shooting people. Telly was our first celebrity guest on this show. His remarkable story is worth a second look. And there's a postscript that we didn't bring you the first time. I was never superstitious. I'll give you a ride. But then something happened in my life which scared the hell out of me. And for something like that to happen to me is something that I can't understand to this day. God knows how many years ago. Let me think now. 58, 59. It's a lot of years ago. Now, I just left off a date, and it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm going home to Long Island after dropping her off. And as would happen, I ran out of gas. So I start walking through the woods, a wooded area, not the woods, going up. And as I'm doing that, I hear a voice say, I'll give you a ride. I turn around, and there's this guy in the Cadillac. And I didn't hear the Cadillac. You hear the voice, and uh, what do you see? I see a guy in a white suit, and uh, I hear an effeminate voice. Hey, I'll give you a lift. I said, that's very nice. I said, I'm going to a gas station. We get to the gas station, talking very nice. And uh, I'm f fumbling around in my pockets. And he says, I'll lend you a dollar. Well, I didn't ask him for money. And the truth is, I was broke. And I says, well, look, I says, uh, you know, <laughs> I work for the State Department, and, well, anyway, give me your name and address, all right? Allow me to mail it to you, because I'm very embarrassed. Anyway, I go there, I get a can, pay for the gas, and we start driving back to my car to put the gas in the car, and I thought that was very nice of him. Get to my car, put the gasoline in. He pushes me to get it started. Pushes me to get it started. My car starts. I thank him very much. Well, in all, it's a very lovely experience to meet someone to help you out like that. No incident whatsoever. Go home, go to work in the morning, and then I remember that he gave me a piece of paper for me to send a buck to. I look at it, and there, besides the address, is a telephone number. Okay. Pick it up, and I call the number. Jimmy's Bar. Oh, I said, well, can I speak to Mr. Cullen, please? Who? Oh. Mr. Collins, just a minute. Woman gets on the phone. Who's calling? Hi, hi. May I speak to Mr. Cullen, please? He's not here. Well, when do you expect him? Who is this? I says, well, I, I was with Mr. Cullen last night. He gave me this telephone number, and he said I could reach him here. She says... Look, you son of a bitch. I don't know what you're talking about. You're talking about my husband, and he's been dead for two years. Anyway, I wouldn't let it go. I did get in touch with the woman again. I did meet her in New York. She came down from Boston. Because, you know, this is a little too much. The clothes I described were the clothes he was buried in. The piece of paper that he gave me sound, signed James Cullen. She brought a letter that he wrote her when he was in the army. It had Jimmy on that. Outside of that, the signature is identical. There's only one thing that was different. I said, uh, he had a high voice. She said, oh, no, 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 she said. He had a deep voice like yours. Oh. Then it meant he killed himself. Boom. This way. Right through the voice. Box, whatever. Anyway, this story happened to a guy like me, and as I say, it's been haunting me now close to 40 years. It was at this point that Telly ended his story. But a little while later, and after a little prompting, he gave a glimpse of just how powerfully 
the incident had affected him. Years later, on November the 22nd, 1963, he was playing golf with two friends when the same man with the same eerie voice reappeared in his life. I'm playing golf right here in California. And uh, I think it was the seventh hole or the sixth hole at El Caballero. I think it's a par three. And as we're shooting, I'm playing with famous uh, personality here called Dennis James and the guy, Merrill Heater, who's the nephew of Gabriel Heater, a commentator in this country. And uh, as we approach the tee, from far away I hear this guy on top of a hill saying, Telly, and I turn around. I started shaking because the voice was somehow familiar. It was the voice of that man dressed in white that long ago night on Long Island. He says, did you hear what happened in Dallas? Says, what? Then I asked Dennis, did you hear that? Yeah, I said, what did he say? He said, I don't know. And now I'm shaking. We play the seventh hole, play the eighth hole, play the ninth hole. We go inside to get something to eat. We're sitting down, television is on. I order whatever the hell I ordered. Then Walter Cronkite breaks in. This president has just been shot in Dallas, Texas. Oh, God. I, that's how I was. Same voice you heard in yeah. that car that night. Yeah. A man that's dressed that. in white. And an hour and a half before the bulletin broke on CBS. At time, they shot him. That's only half the story. I'm not going to tell you the rest. Uh, it doesn't end there. I wish the hell it would. But as I say, to happen to somebody like me is... I don't comprehend. Because if two don't make four, two and two, it startles me. Oh.